We're continuing in our Acts series, and today's scripture reading comes from Acts chapter 1, verses 23 to 26. Please give your full, undivided attention to the reading of God's holy word. And they were put forward to Joseph, called Barsabbas, who is also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in the ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. This is the word of God. At this time, let's give our attention to the preaching of God's holy word. Thank you. Thank you for the reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. It's good to be back together in the new year, worshiping with you, CCSC. We're going to continue through this act series. And I actually had to break this up into two parts because it got a little lengthy. I thought about a lot of practical applications for you and for me. And so this is really part one, okay, on this uh, huge topic of decisions we want to learn how the early church made decisions and how should we. So, obviously, 2023, a lot of us are going to be forced to make decisions. Why? Wow, I didn't notice that water drop right there. That's incredible. New Year decisions, maybe New Year indecisions are undecided. Sometimes you may not be able to decide some decisions. You know, how can you improve your health? What can you do better about your finances? Should you trust a certain person? How can you restore, reconcile a certain relationship that you may be feeling is falling apart? Should you move jobs or change careers? I'm going to assume that all the options you have before you, okay, are legal, moral, and biblical. So the question today and into next week is, which is best out of all those seemingly good options? The question is being raised, how were decisions made by the early disciples, which is students or followers of Jesus, and how should we? All right, so Pastor D. Penn read from Acts chapter 1. One occasion, they need to select a successor to Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus. They come to a decision to choose Matthias. How? How did they make that decision? It says they cast lots. They cast lots. All right? That is no different from flipping a coin, okay, or pulling a high card, playing a certain game. And maybe some of you are thinking, yes, that is my kind of church. That's what I'm talking about. That would be incredible if church decisions were made this way. Let's just roll the dice. But this was certainly not the only thing that they did. It's simply not just about casting lots. When you and I have to make significant, important decisions, all the more important would demand this. Please don't isolate or overvalue one single factor. Please don't just gamble and cast lots. You may not have noticed that in this passage, before they casted lots, they were doing a lot of very good things. Remember as an undergrad in college, how lazy and lame it was of me that if I went out on the first date with a gal, if it went well to any degree, I just thought, this is it. She's the one. How lame was that? And of course, then I met Sunny and went on four dates and she married me anyways after four my girls think that was a crazy, crazy gamble. I don't recommend it, of course, but God is gracious. But how in the world did the early followers make these decisions? Again, before they casted lots, they were caught up in the worship of God, prayer, and they were listening to Holy Spirit-filled preaching. In other words, the early followers, before they did that, random chance they were close to God they were living closer to God they were talking to God they were hearing from God 
And in that context, to that group of people, oh, you can go ahead and cast lots. Look at verses 21 and 22 of chapter 1, which we did not read. Apostle Peter rises up to select a successor, and he lays out clear criteria. Quote, So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. Do you hear that? Before the lots, there were clear objective standards. There were requirements, at least two, experience, a length of time that this man has been with us or among us. Second, eyewitness of the resurrection of Jesus. And so you see, based upon clearer criteria, based upon worship, based upon prayer, based upon a lifestyle of hearing the scriptures preached by the movement of the Holy Spirit, then they can entrust the lots to his Sovereign leading, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33 states, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. So just the first example, as we open up the book of Acts, going about decision making is they casted lots. Here's a second example. Chapter six, verses one through four. They had a congregational meeting. A second way to make godly, good, wise decisions. They had a congregational meeting. And by the way, here at our church, we are so sensitive and accommodating to you. Ours is February 5th. February 5th, folks. Super Bowl is the next week. Don't worry. There's really no NFL game of importance. They call it the Hall of Fame. But I don't know anyone who watches that. Do you see how accommodating we are to you? You must come on February 5th if you are a member of this church. But look at the first four verses of chapter 6. If we can get to this text. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, this church was growing. A complaint by the Hellenist Greek, Greek in culture, arose against the Hebrews. Against the Hebrews. Because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the 12, the 12 apostles, the 12 original eyewitness followers of Jesus, summoned the full number, you see, the congregation of the disciples, and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. I take much heart that even at the early church, as it grew, there was a conflict or a complaint that arose. And it was of the sort of an ethnic and economic injustice. It was utterly divisive within that original congregation. Now, the apostles stood up and said, to clarify what their calling is from God, In no way, shape, or form are the apostles saying that they are above and superior to waiting on or serving tables. No, Jesus said, no servant of mine is above my master. Jesus knelt down, as you heard from Pastor Dinko, to wash his disciples' feet. The apostles and leaders are not saying we are better off. We're just better than people who serve. No, 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 no. But he's just saying, they're saying this. They articulate their calling to commit to it and to protect it for the overall continued health and growth of the church and of themselves. That they are dedicated to the word of God and to prayer. And how did they go about making a decision to rectify this injustice? To bring about reconciliation. To bring a wall down of division. Congregation, let's all meet. You choose among yourselves. You choose. Men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit. And of course, you better select people of wisdom. And then what the original 12 apostles just did was, they just came alongside and confirmed it. So in Acts chapter 1, a certain decision was made by casting lots. 
Acts chapter 6, a certain decision was made in a congregational meeting where people choose among themselves. A third example, quickly, Acts chapter 15. We call it the Jerusalem Council. The Jerusalem Council. Look at verses 2 and 6 of Acts chapter 15. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them. Who's them? People who are spreading false teaching. People who are spreading heresy. Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. Evidently in Jerusalem, the apostles and the elders, along with Paul and Barnabas, were gathering. Look at verse 6. The apostles and the elders are gathered together to consider this matter. So, the greatest doctrinal internal threat to the early church of Jesus Christ had to be taken up by a larger gathering, a larger assembly. With, mind you, lengthy, heated discussion and debate. It already started in verse 2. This took place in Jerusalem. And in Acts chapter 15, this decision had to be taken up by the largest possible gathering or assembly because it required that kind of wisdom and care and counsel. Now, you know, CCSC happens to be a Presbyterian church, secondary to us. The gospel comes first, but we are a Presbyterian church in governance. What that means is we have at least three courts of governance, at least three. We have a session, a group of elders. Then if things don't get resolved there, or we need just more outside counsel, we can go to our presbytery, presbytery, second court. And then if that doesn't get resolved there, we need more counsel and care, we can go to the larger assembly called the General Assembly. In the Presbyterian government, for all of its faults, it requires checks and balances. It assumes that every local church needs internal and external objective wisdom. These are all layers of shepherding and of care. But notice in Acts chapter 15 how this is taking place, whether you call it Presbyterian or not. Even Paul and Barnabas, even the apostles here, did not decide this matter should just be taken care of amongst ourselves, just in small locales. It was so significant. It was so egregious. It was so potentially global. And it would threaten to betray the gospel that they took it to a Jerusalem council. A quick summary so far of Acts 1, Acts 6, and Acts 15. There are non-negotiables at play, my friends. When you heard the title, Decisions, you just might be waiting, Pastor, just get me to that. How do I make decisions? I'll listen, I'll process it, just please tell me how. But I want you to understand, there are non-negotiables that first must be at play. Worship of God, prayer, regular reception and intake and actual digestion and application of scriptural teaching. Then there were clear criteria, requirements. Then there was a congregational meeting, and if needed, an appeal to a larger, greater, broader discussion and wisdom. Nothing less. All right, now we'll get to the question now, just part one today. What directions must we learn toward making better decisions? I just got two today, two more next week, and a lot of practical comfort and encouragement next week, okay? Just two today. What directions must we learn toward making better decisions? First, first. Oh, and it comes first. And it's probably needed more than ever, okay? Detox. They're all going to start with a D, the four directions. I think two more next week. There might be more. Don't hold me to that. But two at least today. They all start with a D, detox. Brett McCracken, in a book entitled The Wisdom Pyramid of 2021, made these three observations. Number one, we have too much information. Number two, we receive too much information too quickly. And number three, the information is too focused on the individual self. All right, three observations of our current culture, age, mood, lifestyle. Number one, too much information. Number two, too much information too quickly. Number three, it isolates 
Mm -hmm. See, it exalts, it centers, it orients. You know, all the algorithms custom made for who? For you. Me, myself, and I. And just as your physical body reacts and revolts to an unhealthy diet, if you're 25, you don't know this is true. At 45, you will feel it true. Just as your physical body reacts and revolts to a most unhealthy diet, so does your mind, so does your heart, so do your emotions, so does your mood, so does your soul. Neil Postman predicted all the way back in the 1980s, this is just the onslaught and the avalanche of just TV news media. Those symptoms that Neil Postman predicted back then are too obvious now, are they not? In the I generation, Generation Z and beyond. And this is all the result of information sensory overload. They include anxiety, stress, disorientation or fragmentation, impotence, Decision and commitment phobia. Decision and commitment phobia. You ever catch that? Even while you're trying to pick one show on Netflix? Isn't that remarkable? When you have too many options, you can't even choose one of the options because you're thinking about which one might be the best use of my time. And confirmation bias. Does any of this sound familiar? You know, a lot of people want to believe and pretend as if you can live post-truth. A lot of people have said that in the West, we're in a post-Christian area. Oh, that is absolutely true. Culturally speaking, academically speaking, entertainment speaking, post-Christian age. But a lot of people say, oh, I'm past truth. We're post-truth. People want to believe that this actually could be true. But your body always defies it. Your physical body and mind and our psyches, yes, and our feelings and just our inner well-being, if you're not even spiritual, that's fine. But all of it, you cannot defy or live past immutable laws, truths, and realities of our natural world. You cannot. It revolts with an unhealthy diet. So Brett McCracken offers a wisdom pyramid similar to our food pyramid. Remember those little triangular food pyramids? At the bottom is the thing you're supposed to eat the most. At the top, you're supposed to very, very much be very discerning. At the bottom then of the wisdom pyramid, most foundational, most influential, most life or death giving would be what? The Bible. Meaning most of our time should be spent Thinking about reading, hearing, listening, digesting, studying, applying the Word of God and the Bible. That's the foundation. That's the bottom of the pyramid. The next layer up, according to McCracken, which I will not disagree with, would be most time should be spent there is the church, the life of the church. Now, what's on top? What's on the top, the apex of that pyramid? Social media. And the internet. Yeah, very good dear friends of mine here at the church. They're selling a, an inversion table. I saw it on Instagram. Anyone want an inversion table? And I remember when I had a bad back, I used to hang on one of these inversion tables upside down. But have you ever hung upside down an inversion table too long? Try it out for two hours. Just invert for two hours. You are going to feel so sick, so dizzy, disoriented, lost. And my friends, so many of you live like that. You are living upside down. Don't you see it and feel it? How much you need a detox before we even get into the realm of how do I make good decisions? 
Detox. What's foundational? Where do you spend the most time? Now we get to a second. A second D. Develop biblical worldview. Develop a biblical worldview. There is no substitute for this development. We must learn a biblical worldview. In other words, do you know what I mean by a biblical worldview? In that situation, in that crisis, in that stress, to have a biblical worldview means, do you know what God thinks? Do you know how he thinks? Do you know why he thinks what he thinks? Do you have any clue as to how God gets to that conclusion? Do you have his frame of mind? Do you have his world view? Did you know that the mind or the brain of God is offered to you? That it can be developed? That it can be strengthened and clarified and refined and nuanced and applied? My goodness. A basic question, right? I know you're tired of hearing it. But I want you to understand, this is really make or break for your life. Do you read and learn and study the Bible regularly, intelligently, deeply, contextually, and practically? If not, you are living out the worldview you presently know. Develop a biblical worldview. Not only from current culture, current academies, current vibes and moods are our worldviews developed, but I can't get past this too quick. Most of it's from your family of origin. It's from your family of origin. Some of you grew up in families. You have no clue how your parents made decisions. See, a lot of us in Asian American circles, everything's suppressed. It's all hush hush. It's behind closed doors. All you heard was some yelling. He was angry. He was desperate. It was anxious. It might have been violent. And all you saw and all you breathe and feel is dysfunction. Ah, if that's your family of origin, how do you think you will go about making decisions today? A lot of incoherence. Feeling lost, nausea, anxiety, desperation, fear. Some of you grew up with the American dream on steroids. If you just work hard at it, you will succeed. You must. We traveled all the way over here so that you would succeed and have a better life than we do. Understandable, yes. But if you are living out the American dream, maybe not dysfunction. This is why Asian Americans have reports of the highest neuroses, highest levels of unhappiness, highest levels of despair and addictions. Did you know that? Maybe the American dream isn't all that we dreamed it to be. You must develop a biblical worldview. You must develop a biblical worldview. For all other worldviews and dreams and drives and habits and origins and formations and philosophies end up dead. They end up self-destructive. You can mark it because God's mind tells me so. Develop a biblical worldview. Now, in a biblical worldview, there are two realities, two activities, if you say. Number one, you and I get to freely choose. We freely do decide. Therefore, you're held completely responsible. That's number one. One activity. You and I freely choose. Second, from the greatest monumental, like, turning point events of your life to the seemingly most 
like insignificant, mundane, random thing that ever happened to your life, like this little minor detail. Did you know that the Bible reveals God determines all that? First activity, you and I freely choose. Second activity, God determines all of it. Everything is free. Everything is fixed. Do you have that worldview? Everything is free and everything is fixed. Fixed and free. How do we know this? Acts chapter 2, the first great Christian sermon. Chapter 2, verses 23 and 24. Speaking of Jesus and what happened at the cross. This Jesus delivered according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Huh. God knew it happened. God allowed it to happen. God does not rejoice in it happening, but this is determined by God, allowed by God. Then he turns around and says, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. You're free. You are held accountable. You're going to be called to judgment. You will be called to judgment for how you crucified and killed the Son of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Verse 24, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Listen, what does it say here? Everything is free. Everything is fixed. And both are held to be true in this document called the Westminster Confession of Faith. We read certain catechisms, and some of you just kind of bored, and you kind of fall asleep through that. But can I suggest it this way? Do you know that the Westminster Confession of Faith and these confessions and these documents are still the finest, like, Wikipedias around? Do you have trouble like me? Do you really want to read the entire Bible by yourself and figure everything else on your own? The Westminster Confession of Faith gives you these topics and headings, and then it just spells out, gathering all the biblical data and evidence that they could, and I would say, maybe one of the most finest, sophisticated, clearest fashions human beings have come up with to this day. A biblical worldview. See, because here's what fatalism says. Some of you actually have a fatalistic worldview. It says, no matter what you do, no matter what you do, it doesn't matter it's fixed. Everything is fate. Some of you believe and live out self determination. You make and master your own destiny. What you do with your life, that's what becomes of it. It's all up to you. But here comes the Bible. Here comes God's mind. Here comes God's sovereignty. Here comes God's wisdom. Here's the worldview. The Bible never makes you passive, lazy, unthinking, uncaring, undisciplined, indifferent, as a fatalist would. At the same time, the Bible always warns you from absolute autonomy, total self-determination. Because it says stuff like, you know, if you're prideful... Pride always goes before a fall. Do you know that? Did you know that it says not sometimes, maybe it's like half the time, maybe most of the time? Go look it up. Did you know that if you're a prideful person, always you're headed for doom? Did you know that if you're a prideful person, you're always going to face cataclysmic, cataclysmic disaster? Because the beginning of biblical wisdom is to not trust yourself entirely because the Bible makes you more self-aware than any other document or teaching ever could you know you are riddled with foolishness you know you are riddled with pride you know you are riddled with confirmation bias you know you are short-sighted you know you're sinful and therefore here comes along a biblical worldview which frees you from fatalism and self-determination. So please, my dear friends, I don't know how else to put it for CCSC as we go into 2023. I do frankly shudder to think about how many of you actually have ever developed a mind of God. It's going to take some detox. You must detox. Less and less at the top of that pyramid, my friends. 
You'll be fine. You're not going to die. Less and less at the top of the pyramid. Do you have any moments of silence or reflection? Do you spend any time not only upon the scriptures but in prayer? Because in Acts chapter 1 it says, Oh Lord, we pray so that we could discern and figure out what you want, whom you've already chosen. Detox. And second, develop. Develop. Read, listen to, seek, study. Learn the Bible regularly, intelligently, practically. <laughs> One example before we close. You know how practical a biblical worldview is? I, it's just, I'll just give you one example here. If your motif in life is to make as much money as you can, and you add to that as easily and quickly as you can, That's your drive in life. Make as much money as I can. Oh, you could say it's for security. You could say it's for your kids. But you know what the Bible says about that in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10? If your drive in life is to make as much money as you can, as quickly and easy as you can, it says you're driven by greed. You're never driven by God. And then he says there's temptation there. Then he says it's senseless there. Then he says it's harmful there. Then he says it's destructive there. At least four words from the ESV in two verses where Apostle Paul just goes off on the love of money or greed as being a poison that will bring down the entirety of your life. Did you not know that even Jesus Christ turned around one day and says, well, let's say you do get it. Let's say you succeed. I want as much money as I can, as quickly as I can. Let's say you get it. And then Jesus declares for the whole world to hear, what good is it to gain the whole world and then lose your soul? You are without God. Ah, so Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world. (laughs) Do not be conformed to this world. Not Orange County. Not Los Angeles. Not your PTA. Not your club. Not your kids. Do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed. By the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. What is good and acceptable and perfect. My friends, you do not know better than God. You will never govern and make decisions better than God. The only way your mind will be transformed and not warped and corrupted by everything and everyone around you, it's happening all the time, is by the renewing of your mind through the word of God and by his Holy Spirit. It takes a lot of discipline and time. That's why retreats are really good with the theme of renewal, but it takes a lot of discipline and time. Well, my friends, next week, oh, can't wait to follow with two more D's, more directions, and then more comforts and confidence for decision-making. But as we close here, I want you to know this. Of course, I want you to know this at CCSC. Jesus never, ever, ever, ever made one bad decision. He never made one desperate, foolish, fearful, hurried decision so that he lived so that he could live he could die and he could rise again for every one of yours especially your worst decisions the gospel is God is not in the business of you making better decisions the good news is Jesus loved and died for you to make you into someone like him 
The gospel is Jesus never made a bad decision. So you can be beloved while you make bad ones. You can be forgiven after you failed in some. You can be healed after you wreak all kinds of havoc and hurt. Because God will always get it right. He always has and he always will. God will get it right. As long as you decide, you decide detox develop. At least start with those two. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the riches, the power, the wisdom, and the practicality of your word. Oh, I pray that it would do its supernatural work. Cleanse us. Lord, please discipline your people away from all the voices and truths and information and drive us, O Lord, to you to see a beauty, to see such marvels and to see such directions there that you want us to have. Oh, hear us, we pray. Hear us, we pray. Can I just give you a couple seconds, your moments? Pray with me, pray with me. Lord, cleanse me. I will go through some detox this year. Please, Lord, help me. Detox my mind, my heart. And drive me now into the riches, the intelligence, the wisdom, the practical helps of your word by your spirit. Pray with me and then we'll sing a song.